And if you remember, the best possible arrangement for three bonds is this equilateral triangle shape, also known as trigonal planar, with bond angles of 120 degrees. So 120 degrees separate these atoms, these atoms, and these atoms. Okay, and this is why this compound with three bonds has a trigonal planar shape, all right? So, hey, this brings us to the third and last basic shape a compound can be, which is linear. So, let's get this down. Okay, so the third basic shape a compound can be is linear. And go ahead and put in parentheses right next to this one, 180 degrees. Because guess what, you guys, linear compounds have bond angles of 180 degrees. All right, so let's write down a couple more things about this guy. And linear compounds consist of not four sigma bonds, not three, but this time two sigma bonds or lone pairs. Okay, so linear compounds consist of two sigma bonds or lone pairs. A combination of two sigma bonds or lone pairs. And remember, it can still have multiple bonds, right, you guys? But the only thing that determines shape is sigma bonds or lone pairs, right? So hey, let's look at an example of a linear compound. Let's look at CO2, carbon dioxide. All right, so CO2 looks like this, a C double bonded to an oxygen, and another one. Okay, so this is good practice, you guys. How many sigma bonds and how many pi bonds are in this compound? Well, hey, there's one sigma bond connecting this oxygen to this carbon and another sigma bond connecting this carbon to this oxygen, right? So let me outline those in green. There's one sigma bond, there's another sigma bond, giving us a total of two sigma bonds. That means that all the other bonds that we see in this compound must be pi bonds, all right? So we've got one here and one here that I've left in black, giving us a total of two pi bonds, all right? So Cool, we've just figured out that this thing has two sigma bonds in green and two pi bonds that I left in black, okay? But hey, when it comes to determining the shape of a compound, do we pay any attention to these pi bonds in black? No, right? You only look at how many sigma bonds or lone pairs you have on that central atom, okay? And in this case, we have one, two sigma bonds. No lone pairs, but two sigma bonds, all right? So, hey, if you remember, the best possible arrangement for two bonds is for them to point in complete opposite directions in a straight line. And that's why we call this thing linear because they're pointing in like a straight line away from each other with bond angles of 180 degrees. So 180 degrees on this side and 180 degrees on this side. It's linear. All right, so that's it for shapes and bond angles, you guys. You've seen the three basic shapes, tetrahedral, trigonal, planar, and linear, and their corresponding bond angles, right? And this is really just a memorization thing, and you could have done it on your own, but I was just trying to help you understand a little bit more to the story, so maybe you don't have to memorize as much, okay? So the next thing I want to cover is how covalent bonding works. And there are a bunch of theories out there, you guys. Everyone has their own theory, but there are two main theories that are widely accepted to be the most accurate. So those are the ones I'm going to teach you. Okay, so VS EPR theory told us the general shapes that compounds bond in. Now let's see how these compounds actually bond though. And there's two theories that work together to give us the most accurate description of covalent bonding. And these two theories are The first theory on covalent bonding is known as molecular orbital theory, also known as MO theory. Let's write that down. The first theory is molecular orbital theory, also known as MO theory, okay? And the second theory on covalent bonding is known as the orbital hybridization theory. Orbital hybridization theory. And the way we've been talking about bonding so far is a slightly watered down version of MO theory. 
I've been telling you kind of how bonding happens. MO theory is going to tell us exactly how bonding happens, okay? So, hey, let me start off with MO theory because you already got pretty much the gist of this story, but MO theory is going to fill in the details about bonding that we didn't talk about yet. Then we'll finish with orbital hybridization theory, which explains a little bit more about the shapes of compounds, okay? So let's start off with MO theory. Okay, so what is molecular orbital theory? Well, MO theory states that a covalent bond is just the overlap of atomic orbitals to share electrons. Let's write that down. So MO theory says that a covalent bond, all this is is the overlap of atomic orbitals, and this is an important point, atomic orbitals, to share electrons. Okay, so a covalent bond is equal to the overlap of atomic orbitals to share electrons. So according to MO theory, a covalent bond forms by atomic orbitals overlapping and sharing electrons. But dude, this is just a fancy way of saying something you guys already know. You knew that atoms were bonded together by two types of glue. You knew that one of those types of glue came from sharing electrons, and you knew that sharing electrons between atoms was called covalent bond, right? So, hey, now that I've refreshed you on what you already knew, let's hear what MO theory has to say one more time. And MO theory says that a covalent bond forms by atomic orbitals overlapping and sharing electrons. And duh, you know that a covalent bond comes by sharing electrons, so the only part to that sentence that we need to clear up is this part about atomic orbitals overlapping, right? Okay, but hey, before we can talk about atomic orbitals overlapping, we gotta first know what an atomic orbital is, right? And you already know what an atomic orbital is, we just didn't call it by that name. If I, if I were to ask you what an orbital is, what would you tell me? Well, you'd tell me that it was that green rectangular box that we drew on our diagram of that atom, right? You'd then tell me that it was located in the subshells of an atom, and then you'd finally tell me what I want to hear, that an orbital is the exact location of an electron, if we could find where that was, right? And that's all an atomic orbital is, you guys. An atomic orbital is just the orbital we've been talking about this whole time. The only reason why they call it an atomic orbital here is because, hey, where are orbitals found, you guys? In atoms, right? That's why they call them atomic orbitals. So, hey, don't get confused just because they stuck this word atomic in front. Because you know what an orbital is. It's just the exact location of an electron, if it could be found. Hey, but since we can't pinpoint the location of an electron exactly, we just have to do our best and guess where it is, right? And the way we guess is with mathematical equations. So let's go ahead and write a couple things down before we get overwhelmed by all this information, okay? So we're talking about atomic orbitals. Atomic orbital. And what's an atomic orbital? the location of an electron, right? But let's be a little bit more specific and say that an atomic orbital is the location of an electron with respect to its nucleus. So an atomic orbital, this is gonna be the location of an electron with respect to its nucleus. But, remember you guys, but the exact location of an electron can't be found. So the exact location can't be found. Right you guys? Therefore, we can only talk about the probability of an electron being in a region. Therefore, can only talk about the probability of an electron being found in a region. Being, sorry that got a little messy, in a region. So, the exact location of an electron can't be found, therefore you can only talk about the probability of an electron being found in that region, right? 
And this probability is determined by math equations from quantum mechanics, okay? So, hey, this probability, it's determined by math equations from quantum mechanics. And let's just say this is determined by math EQNS, equations, okay? But if you graph this probability equation, you get your atomic orbital, okay? So, hey, let's recap this one more time. The location, okay, so an atomic orbital is the location of an electron with respect to its nucleus. But we know that the exact location can't be found, right? Therefore, we can only talk about the probability of an electron being within a region. And this probability is determined by math equations, okay? And check it out, because if you graph these math equations, you get your atomic orbital. So let's write that down. If you graph these EQNS, these equations, then this is equal to your atomic orbital. Okay, so what this is saying, you guys, because I don't know quantum mechanics and you don't need to know it either, all this is saying is that the probability of finding an electron in a region, the probability of finding where an electron is, you can find this out by a math equation. And if you graph this equation, if you plot out this equation on graph paper, then you're gonna get shapes, right? And if you guys have taken a geometry or calculus class, then you know that there's an equation for things like circles or ovals or parabolas, right? And if you graph those equations out, that's what they look like. Like you plot out a bunch of points and connect them and they look like a circle, right? Or a hyperbola or whatever shape that equation tells you, right? And this is the same thing with atomic orbitals. Some crazy physicist with a lot of time on his hands figured out the equation that would give us the shape of the region of where an electron is located at. And this region is known as an atomic orbital, okay? So, hey, an atomic orbital is just the graphed out